right, I think we're going to go ahead and get started. It's 11 o'clock. Uh, so today we're going to be talking about navigating the migration landscape, uh, specifically going through our Princeton University migration project where we migrated over a thousand Drupal websites to a single platform. So I'm Andy Englert. Um, I work for FFW. I'm a solutions consultant there. Uh, we're a digital agency. We focus on uh, just that full digital experience um, and particularly do a lot in Drupal. And uh, my name is Jill Maraca and I'm senior director of a group at Princeton called Web Development Services. I'll tell you a little bit more about us. Uh, there's 14 of us. We're in the central IT office. We support a little over 1,100 Drupal websites and uh, somewhere a little over 600 WordPress sites. Uh, if you do the math, it's about 100 plus websites per team member that we're supporting. So uh, efficiency at good multi-site platform is really important to us. So I'm going to start off today by telling you a little bit about our project. Um, it was essentially to get off Drupal 7. Um, we wanted to get it off as quickly as possible. We didn't want to drag out the project. We wanted to do it uh, quickly and efficiently. I'll, I'll, I'll tell you a little bit more about quickly later. And um, we wanted to make it easy for our site owners too. We didn't want to disrupt them too much. They were busy. They didn't want to go through an upgrade and they needed to continue their day-to-day -day work. And uh, we also wanted to reduce platform maintenance. So if you see the diagram on this slide, we had three different Drupal I'll call them platforms that we wanted to consolidate into one because maintaining one is easier than maintaining three. So the, the first, I'll call it a bundle, uh, it would, we called it our site builder platform. So you'll hear me refer to our Princeton Drupal as site builder, we call it, that's what we branded it the Princeton Site Builder. So we had um, the Site Builder bundle, which was about 300 sites. We had an Open Scholar bundle, which was about 700 sites. And then we had a custom bundle, which was actually 34 different code bases of websites. And so we wanted to move into one Site Builder. Uh, and along the way, of course, we wanted to improve accessibility. So that's, that's the project, get off Drupal 7. The scope of the upgrade um, was this. We knew we wanted to do all of our Drupal 7 sites. So by the end of the project, we could say, we're done, no more Drupal 7. Um, but we had to ask ourselves some questions along the way. How many really needed to migrate? Were there any dead ones that didn't have to go? Uh, we knew we wanted the scope to include most of the modules or replicate most of our features, but we also had to ask ourselves along the way, well, what's incompatible? What can't we do or what do we have to change? We knew we were going to upgrade most or all of the content, really. We weren't going to leave anything behind. We weren't going to make decisions about deleting content because that would have to involve the site owner, then we'd have to ask, and then they'd have to go look through something. So we decided we're going to, we're going to move all their files and pictures, whether they needed them or not, for expediency. Um, but we, we also knew that we had some content types that might be a one-off that we were not going to migrate. And we had to talk about how might we convince the site owner to give up the one-off content type. So all content moved, most content types were moved and, and replicated. Uh, we had to ask ourselves, are we gonna move and replicate most of our layouts? Um, really, we don't know how many we actually had going on between the three platforms. And we knew from the start that we were only gonna um, move a handful of themes. So that's our scope. Uh, we did a little, uh, some counting. This is a ballpark counting. So we knew we had about 1,000 sites across all three of those bundles, 100 plus news and events items, 25,000 plus publications, 1,000 website editors, we have courses and all sorts of things. So that's the project, that's the scope. Uh, from the get-go, we, we had to, figure out what success looks like and we had to write it down because for such a long project you can it can drag it can go on and on and you had to remind yourself like this is success we're working towards success keep going this is this is this is good 
So we had wrote down um, ahead of November 2022, we were going, this is way back when the end of life for Drupal 7 was sooner. So we were going with the sooner deadline. It's been, it's been moved a few times, the first one. Um, but no longer than the end of the year 2023, we were okay going a little bit beyond November 2022, that uh, all websites running on Drupal 7 are now running on Drupal 9. Um, we knew that one of our success metrics was mid-project, we were going to have to transition from eight to nine during this. And that, that transition was gonna go unnoticed by website owners. And for us, that was gonna be a validation that future Drupal upgrades were gonna be easier. It was also a selling point to our leadership. Like once we get off seven, future upgrades should be easier. So we did go from eight to nine. It wasn't too painful. I'm looking for any of my developers in the room. Nobody, Byron, <laughs> nobody. Uh, uh, it, it happened. It was, it happened, yeah. Um, and also that we wouldn't have to go back and ask for funding to do another upgrade of this size. So the eight to nine upgrade we were able to do in-house. We didn't have to bring on extra teams and get it done. So, uh, and I can say since then we have gone from nine to 10. So all of our Drupal sites are running on 10 today. Um, so that was a success metric. Uh, and we also had the accessibility built in mind. We thought we're, we're pretty darn accessible, but there's always room for improvement. And so we did um, set a metric that we wanted more of our sites to be accessible. And the last one, this is one I kind of put on like all of my projects. I don't always write it down, but I say it out loud. Nobody's going to complain to our CIO about this project. And that the team, we all still like each other at the end of the project. And I think, okay, they're being environment. We still like each other, so I'm worth that too. Okay. Um, these, I think, are the three, the top three success factors to us getting it done. So if you take anything away from today, it's Planning, we spent a lot of time planning, uh, good stakeholder management and communications, and a flexible technical migration plan. So these are like the three main takeaways from today, and this is what we're gonna go into. If there was a fourth, I'd have to say that perfect is the enemy of the good, is the fourth. Um, we had to move, you know, we couldn't just spend time on all of this. I think early on when we were scoping with this calculation, if we perfected everything and looked at every, si every single thing, it was going to take us like 15 years to move. So immediately I drove that point home, like we cannot take 15 years to get up triple seven. We have to move, we have to go. So perfect is the enemy of the good and if any of these points um, made the team unhappy with me. It was me probably saying like, look away, move on, we have to go, just get it upgraded and we can go back and talk to the sign owner about fixing. Um, okay, so getting, so if you remember those three points, planning was number one. We did a ton of planning. And I actually calculated out that our planning time, we spent about 380 hours planning between July 2019 and April 2021. So it wasn't like intense every day. It was long, um, but that's uh, what we did. So there was about um, four of us planning. I think we met maybe once a month. And um, this is what got us to our RFP. Before the I think of planning as like two periods, really. So planning period one is shown in this red icon, April 2018. Planning period one was basically us recognizing that the more Drupal 7 sites we made, the more technical debt we were creating. So in actually in April 2018, we said, we got to stop making Drupal 7 sites. And what we did then was we started to build the next version of what we call the Princeton Site Builder. So uh, that's what I'll call our planning period one. Uh, planning period two then began in July 2019 when we seriously got together and started to say, okay, we have to figure out the scope of this project. We're gonna have to make a funding request to our central IT uh, funders and planning period two is that. Um, Planning period two ended when we selected FFW as our partner. That was about April 2021. And work on the upgrade, the actual let's go, let's get it done, was between April 2021 and May 2023. We 
we had we actually shut down all of our Drupal infrastructure in September 2023. We had like one straggler. We, they were okay. They were a big office, so. Um, and we also wanted the infrastructure running a little longer, like just in case somebody came back and was like, oh, I forgot. Um, so uh, September 2023 felt, felt really good. During planning, you, we had a lot of questions we had to ask ourselves, and, and, and this is some of them. Um, we had to do a lot of looking at our websites. My team built a bunch of them, but we also let people build their own sites. So if, if you don't know anything about my platform, it's like um, point and click, drag and drop. You, you don't need to know, um, have, a, have a technical skill to build a site in it. We make it very easy for people to build sites. And um, they, they can get a little creative with the tools we gave them. So we had to do a lot of looking and also looking back at the early sites we built in which maybe we made a questionable decision to build something some way that at the time it was great, but you know, three years later you're like, ah, why did we do that? We wouldn't do that today. Um, and I also just re-emphasized to the team like, it's, you, it's okay, you know, you didn't know what you didn't know three years ago, so that's fine. So we asked ourselves a ton of questions. And that is what went into the scope. And that's sort of where our buy-in came in, even among the team, like, okay, we're not taking 15 years to move Drupal 7 sites, we gotta, we gotta go. We also had to look at the three bundles and start grouping sites together, because you, you look at 300, you look at 700 bundles of sites, and you go, oh my goodness, where do you start? Um, we had to redefine, not redefine, but we had to just define for ourselves and spell it out like this is what these bundles mean. These are the characteristics in these bundles. And this wording, almost similar wording actually went into our RFP because we also had to explain to vendors like, what it is we had going on here so they could even make sense of it. This is a, an early spreadsheet we use for planning. So you remember I, I said we had to look at lots of sites and, and not quite, we didn't have to open every one up and look at it. Um, one of our developers, um, Brian, I believe, uh, Brian Osborne, he would run scripts to take a look at characteristics and counts and we would put it into a spreadsheet. So in this spreadsheet, you can see things like we started counting how many pages, uh, how many taxonomy terms, how many lines of CSS injector did we have? You, usually lots of CSS injector meant like big, big ugly migration. So you can see some had like, you know, three lines of CSS, some had like, a thousand lines of CSS. <coughs> we had to determine, you know, um, which theme they were using. Uh, and then we started to, um, in this column J, we had, this is our proposed solution. This is where we think they're gonna go. This is where we want them to go. We even got crazy and started to assign point values. So in these colored columns, we, we tried to assign complexity points. Uh, and this, I think this exercise helped a lot because it made us better understand our sites. It made us be able to group and bundle them and, and sort of call them by their names, like this is a complexity one, this is a complexity two. And did, you, did you pick off the hard ones first um, or the easy ones first? Good question. Did we pick off the hard ones first or the easy ones first? I think, so I, we started with the easier ones first. Um, just, just get, yeah. you know, dip our toes in the water. Yeah. The yeah, medium, the medium. Ones. we're sort of medium, yeah. Easy, we, we kind of, we're, we're sure of, but yeah, it's the medium ones. Okay, so then um, that's, that's some of the uh, ingredients that went into our planning parts. Communications was the second part of planning. Um, we had to first get leadership buy-in to, we, and, and to be able to get leadership buy-in, we had to describe what we were going to achieve and do in a non-technical way. So we had to describe the complexity of a Drupal 7 upgrade to them um, so that they would support and, and fund our effort. Uh, we also had to give, the, give people details as soon as possible, the site owners. We had to tell them this is coming, this is what, it, this is what it's gonna include, this is what it's not going to include. It may sound far away, like in the next year or two, we're gonna ask you to upgrade your site. A year or two sounds far away, but it comes up quicker than you think. 
And then we also had to create resources about the project. And those were communication resources, that is. So I'll show you a couple things about that. Um, we had um, three, three websites that talked about this project. The first website was our own uh, service website, so Web Development Services, that's our group. We had uh, an initiatives page, that's what you're seeing on this slide, I know the text is tiny, but basically what this page told people about, this is the project, this is what it includes, and really, most importantly, this is what it does not include. You are going to, and this says it in much nicer words, and I'm gonna say it right now, you are going to lose this thing. You, know, you are not gonna keep this other custom thing. Um, and repeatedly we had we referred people back to the site and they could refer to it. We also sent emails. I did presentations around uh, Princeton's campus. Pe you know, people lose an email, they forget what I say in a presentation. They could always get pointed back to this site. Uh, it had FAQs, what to expect, it had our office hours if they needed a question. Um, so that's our service site. The next thing we created was a documentation site for the site builder platform. This is still in use today, but it, it gave people the idea of like, how do I do something in the new platform? Oh, okay, there's steps, there's help. I don't need to be nervous about moving to the new platform. And the third thing we created, which is also still in use today, and these you can you know go to these links, uh, is our demonstration website. It showed off the features that that are possible in the site. So people like to see. If I tell them, if I tell them something's going to be better or look better, uh, it's not as impactful as showing it. So those are so, so the so the two points: a lot of pre-planning, looking at what it is you've got, and bundling and characterizing, and heck, assigning point values, and two, um, preparing for good customer communications. So I'm going to hand it over to Mandy to talk a little bit about the technical plan. Awesome, thank you. So um, that's sort of where FFW stepped in was just to do the migration part of it. And because of all of this really great planning, it made it a lot easier for us to plan the technical piece of it. So one of the first things that we did when we came in was start to audit the websites, audit the processes, kind of take a good look at the platform um, and actually build um, just a process that had uh, members of the Princeton team involved in it along with members of the FFW team. Uh, so what we had decided on was that uh, Princeton was really going to be handling the site selections, uh, submitting to the change control process, um, dealing with the stakeholder management, while FFW really handled the technical migration itself. So um, actually building out the migration scripts, um, executing those scripts, uh, starting with that QA process, even a manual QA process, uh, cleaning up those defects and handing it off um, to the web uh, development services team uh, so that they could take a look at it and submit it to the stakeholders for um, user acceptance testing. So we just kept going through this loop each time and it got refined more and more and more through each sprint as we went through, but just kind of following this process and making sure that everyone had their roles made it really easy to kind of keep up with it, especially when you're doing a thousand websites at a time. Uh, so we also wanted to break down that migration complexity and start to really figure out how long it was gonna take um, to do certain pieces of this. So uh, to get the migration scripts done and uh, do a lot of the manual QA, especially at the beginning uh, for site builder sites, we were averaging around like 24 hours per website uh, to get the whole thing executed and QA'd, ready to go, so a site builder could take a look at it. And then they had their own uh, timing. I think we said like two or three hours like per site. Uh, so uh, we d broke that down by bundle so that that way we could actually start creating batches from that. So now that we knew how long it was gonna take in each bundle and we knew how many sites were in each bundle, we could break it down and say, okay, so we'll have this many sites from here, this many sites from here, um, and time that specifically to how much time and resources uh, we had per sprint. And uh, so moving those bundles into patches, uh, there was quite a planning process that went into it. Uh, so we wanted to base that based on characteristics, uh, the number of nodes that each site had, uh, content types, customizations, things like that. 
Uh, so the bigger things like the complexity of each site really did uh, move into that decision making process, especially when it came to the CSS injector customizations, any custom embeds. Uh, we wanted to make sure that you know, if those things were going to trip us up, that we talked about it beforehand and that we kind of knew where that was going to cause an issue before we put it into a sprint. Uh, things like site privacy settings, um, again, the number of nodes per site, um, those were smaller pieces of it, but did kind of tell us um, how much time it would take per site. Uh, site priority, this is where like we worked really closely with the Princeton team to be able to see, you know, what was that stakeholder schedule? Were there blackout dates that a stakeholder said, you know, we cannot do our site, you know, for these three months, you can do it before or after. Uh, so we wanted to make sure that we were collecting that as well and make sure that we scheduled our sprints in that way. Um, the components and content types. By keeping those pretty closely aligned in each sprint, we were able to reduce that time as well. Uh, so we tried to do that as much as possible. Obviously, you know, with scheduling and, you know, some stakeholders needing to go at certain times, like it wasn't always perfect. But as much as we could, we tried to align that up. Um, and lastly, just theme alignment. Um, just determining if the design, the themes were close to the theme that they would be migrating to. Um, I know uh, Jill's team gave us a really great list of uh, here are the settings that go for each site. This is the theme that they're going to migrate into. Um, and that really helped our team just kind of look at that and say, okay, here's the map. Let's keep moving forward. <laughs> and another very complex spreadsheet here that's super small that no one's going to be able to see up there. Um, but it is basically we wanted to make sure that we are mapping out how each field um, from the legacy was going to show up in the new platform. Uh, so again, this was a long and really tedious process between the two teams to really kind of go through and say, okay, what widget are we looking at? Uh, what was the machine name for that particular widget? Um, and then what was it migrating to in the future? And that way we could have those conversations about things that were maybe like depreciating. Um, maybe we were losing functionality on certain pieces of it so that that could go in the communication plan. We could also kind of look at it and say, okay, um, you know, this is going to migrate, you know, one to one, no problem. These other things, it's going to look different in the new platform. Let's make sure that stakeholders are aware of that. Um, and it also gave our development teams a really great map for how to go from the first to the second and uh, get those scripts uh, really, really well refined. And during this process, Jill kept telling us, perfect is the enemy of the good. Um, and it was really the theme of this project overall because, you know, when you're trying to move so rapidly, um, you know, mistakes are going to happen, but that's why you're always optimizing. Uh, so, you know, that's what we were always telling our developers as well. It's like, we need to move through this. We need to test something. And as soon as we test it, we can refine it, we can optimize it, we can move forward with it and make it better and better and better. Uh, so that's why we kept that as sort of like a theme throughout the project to make sure that uh, we were all on the same page and that we were all able to get to that end state and make things near perfect towards the end. Uh, yeah. And uh, so the pilot batches that we started with, getting into this uh, was intimidating. It was really hard at first and, and just like just trying to make sure that you know, we had everything worked out. So we started with uh, what we called Batch Zero uh, that contained about 20 websites, um, had a pretty wide variety of websites. And the reason why we did that was because we wanted to test a lot of the scripts, um, not just one or two at a time. We wanted to see everything at once because uh, this was really our test batch. Um, and then we had a pretty elastic timeline between when that batch zero and that proof batch uh, started uh, because we wanted to make sure that we got those migration fixes in. Uh, we wanted to make sure that we optimized everything as much as possible before we moved in uh, to that next batch. So when we moved into what we called proof batch uh, one, it contained another small number of websites, just like 20 to 25 sites. And we saw that there was a lot smaller amount of fixes that were needed. We improved our QA time. Um, and that's when we knew, okay, we can really start getting into this process. 
Um, so that's when uh, Jill and her team were able to kind of refine that process, go out with the stakeholder comms, um, and we were able to put together really, really well, good, like good put together metrics that really said, you know, this is how much time this piece is gonna take, this piece is gonna take, this is where we're going next. Um, so that stakeholders were aware, but also all of the internal teams were aware before we moved on to batch two and further. And through that process, we also created a lot of different like technical migration checklists uh, just to keep both teams on the same page throughout the entire process. Um, but also, you know, there's a lot of migration that's happening here. There's a lot of websites that are happening. There's sprints that are overlapping to a degree. Uh, so we wanted to make sure that we had people assigned to, you know, just high level pieces of the process so that we could go back and say, oh, okay, this person was supposed to do this. I need to do this part after this person gets their piece done. Um, and it just kept that team collaboration really, really well thought out and clear so that everyone kind of knew their role and everything was really transparent between the teams. And there's always risks and mitigations with this. Um, this is something that you know we looked at at the beginning of the project and we kept talking about throughout. Um, and we wanted to make sure that we were building mitigation plans between the teams to be able to um, meet those risks. Uh, so things like the timeliness of site owner feedback. Um, we wanted to make sure that you know, if we were hitting really slow turnaround times or excessive feedback from site owners, that um, Joe's communication plan was really clearly communicating all of these deadlines, um, everything about the feedback, when it had to be in by, reminder emails, things like that, so that people knew what to expect and um, knew that you know if they were outside of the process, things could change for them a little bit. Um, and then you know other other pieces of this, you know the coordination of new feature development. Um, if we were seeing something that was coming through that um, would be a new feature need, we could report that to the WDS team to look at it since they were doing a lot of the platform building. Um, defect triage process, that was super helpful just to uh, figure out the nature of some of the migrations. You know, you're going to find that sometimes, you know, things just come up like, like in the middle of the migrations, you know, in the middle of the process, one website will have something super weird on it that you didn't expect and then uh, you just have to kind of have a triage process for it. Um, and lastly, that CSS injector migrations. Uh, those, those were tough to look at and deal with uh, as far as customizations go. Um, so the WDS team was actually really, really great in providing notes on which ones do we bring over, which ones don't we bring over, um, and making those decisions to kind of streamline that process. And actually, Jill, you have a great stakeholder comp plan. Yeah, so um, if you remember, we had those three bundles. We had the site builder, we had the open scholar sites, and we had the custom sites. And so we had, we had um, this, this chart you see right here is basically the process, but we did tailor it to the three different bundles. Um, and we, really what we did by batching the upgrades and the migrations, we could just rinse, repeat, keep going, do the same thing. Um, it, wasn't, it wasn't all perfect and smooth. You know, you would get someone who might have ignored our multiple emails about not editing content during a certain window. We did want them to hold off for like a week if they could. And if they didn't, we told them, just write down, remember what you did, because you've got to redo it. Um, that happened mostly on our site builder bundles. Uh, and what we would do either is rerun a piece of the migration. We tried not to, but if it depended on how much it was. Uh, otherwise, we would tell them, oh, hey, why not just copy paste that over? It gives you a chance to learn the new platform. This is a great opportunity. Okay. Or if it was small, we might have take, taken it on, just done it for them so we could launch. So, you know, any reason to get them to launch in the Drupal, the new Drupal platform was it. If, if, if copying like five pages over was their blocker, we, we just did it and got it done. But, but we didn't want to do that a lot. Um, we did solve that for the Open Scholar bundle where we actually put like a, when they logged in, they got a, a header per batch, like this period, don't edit, don't edit. We had thought about taking away edit access, but we thought, oh, that could go really wrong and then we can generate 100 emails for people wanting us to do stuff. 
So uh, there's a little bumpiness when we had people stop editing, but we didn't take away their permission to edit. Um, I don't think it was too bad at all, not that many sites. Um, this is an example of what I published on my web development services website to tell people about the process, what to expect. Um, the site builder website owners, they had a two week review period where they could report issues and we had a back and forth conversation, exchange, email, help, Zoom, whatever we had to do. Um, and then we would discuss a launch date. The bundle two, the scholar sites, since there were so many more of them and they were smaller and simpler, we didn't even give them a review time. We just said, this is happening now and you're launching on this date. And unless they really came back to us like, no, we, we launched them. We, we had to just move and get it done. And then the custom sites was more of a conversation because they were so tailored. We had to prep them a little bit to say, hey, you've got this now. It's going to change a little bit to this. Um, these were uh, more high touch QA sites. So um, their approval period varied because we did have to communicate some changes to them. Uh, I think the biggest, the biggest thing we did not do was all that CSS injector code, lines and lines of code. We said, you're not getting it. You're moving to what we call our new tiger theme. And if anybody had some uncertainty about it, what, what I would do even is just show them the, the demonstration site. This is what it looks like. I didn't say relax, but I want to tell them relax. Um, and, and like two, two, maybe two websites, I actually did like this very quick homepage mock-up and they were like, oh, okay, this looks good. But so most people were okay giving up their whatever theme it was and going into one consolidated theme we call Tiger. So no more CSS injector? Uh, not during the upgrade, we tried not to do it, um, but if there was one or two little things they wanted, like an accent color, and it made them happy and we could launch them, we would do it. We would, we would rather have put in a few lines of CSS injector to get them to launch than to have them delay a launch. So if you remember these batches are going on, so FFW is, they're migrating, they're migrating, we're handling the launches and the customer communication, and if we don't launch, 10, 20 sites, 30 per week, we're gonna have a pile up. They're gonna keep going and we have a pile up and we don't want a pile up. That was, that is bad. So we had to push people to launch. Um, I remember telling the project manager, um, we had, I said, we're gonna be launching 10, 10 to 30 sites a week. And he was like, that's crazy. I've never even done that in, my, in a month in my life. And we, we just had to move, we had to get them going. Uh, we were consistently reviewing and prioritizing defects. So in between our meetings with FFW and the technical team, we were meeting uh, internally. There was about three to four of us that would meet regularly and go through um, and prioritize the issues. Uh, and if you remember uh, the spreadsheet earlier that Mandy talked about where we had, um, we were mapping features to another feature, we also had a very important column, like how many sites was this thing used on? If it was used on two sites, forget it, we can't spend time on that. If it was used on 700 sites, okay, we gotta spend time on that. So having counts of how many and the usage was, was key. Um, we met internally uh, before we even gave FFW the batches. And what we would do is we would look at the sites and we would say, okay, this group can go together. They've got similarities or something going on and the site owners are, are ready. And we would, we would tee them up and cue them and give them to FFW. So we were doing some decision making there. Uh, some lessons learned. Uh, Batch date communication, so remember there's this batch zero, and we would you know, think batch zero might take two weeks, but if it was bumpy and we had to redo or, or run it again, um, what I found is that if we told the site owners in batch zero a date, um, and then we told the batch ones and the batch twos and batch threes a date, that if batch zero didn't go as quickly as we thought, I'd have to go back and tell the twos, threes yeah, about the date. So um, I wanted to communicate as much as I could, but then I, I, I also tailored our communication templates to say it, for batch twos and threes, it might happen around this date. Batch fours, fives, sixes, I think we got to 10, 11 batches at some point. The dates were more certain. Uh, I talked a little bit about bottlenecks. 
Um, some bundles we had to just push, and the others we wanted to just get them to launch, whatever it would take to get them to launch. Um, timing on manual cleanup. So sure, the scripts covered a lot, but they didn't cover every single thing. And so um, either some people on my team, or we actually had hired on some extra uh, uh, one person for a period of time to do some extra QA help. Um, to just make a couple manual adjustments where we decided that programmatically doing it didn't make sense, but it did look so egregiously bad. We were like, ah, someone just has to go to the page and swap something around. And we thought that that time was worth spending, even though we didn't want to do a lot of manual work. Um, and I talked about the bundle of the site builder, the stakeholder sign off when bundles pile up. So. Uh, I think we made the right call with the Open Scholar sites, just pushing them to launch. And again, nobody complained to the CIO, so we got it done. So recap, these were the three, I think, top things. There's probably 15 ingredients that went into making this a success. Planning, we did a lot of planning. We looked at a lot of our sites. We ran numbers and counts and complexities. Um, and we had to get on the same page about what the migration was and what it was not and we had to be okay with the not especially the design team they they love making every single page the perfect and i'd have to say to them Lee is smiling it looked bad before the upgrade it, it's still gonna look bad we'll try to improve it but we got to move on because we have hundreds more to do and we're not going to take 15 years to do it good stakeholder communications being flexible, but also giving them enough information to make them feel comfortable with what we were about to do to their site. Um, sometimes it was like, look away from this thing you, you lost, but look at this new shiny thing you got. Uh, and certainly having a flexible technical migration plan with FFW where we were doing a batch zero, refining, and, and moving on. So I'm gonna just, I'll pause there for a second. Yeah, we could actually probably. I think we have ten minutes left, so. Yeah, because the next couple slides are just like, what's next? It's we're sort of uh, my team. We're sort of like, we don't have any dribble seven sites. What do we do? You know, it's kind of consumes you for for two years. And you have to keep in mind, my team was also doing this upgrade. So we had two full time people dedicated to the upgrade project, but the rest of the team was doing the usual work. Our usual work is making new websites for the university, redesigning websites for the university. Um, and so in fact, when we were bundling and batching and communicating to people, if any one of our customers said, I don't like that, I don't want that, I want this change and that change, they got pulled out of the migration project, they got sent to a project team, we have two project teams that redesigns and build sites, and they, they got out of the flow of the upgrade. And we would tell them, this is a redesign project, you're gonna work with the other team, and you gotta get it done by by a date. How many of those did you do? How many rebuilds? Ah, oh, that's a good question. I would say maybe less than twenty. Really? Yeah. Oh, that's impressive. Yeah. Who? Yeah, repeat the question. Oh, oh, sorry. The question was how many of those redesigns did we do? How many of those sites got pulled out of the typical migration project? It's maybe twenty, maybe. And by the way, how many was during the? Uh, how much of this was during the pandemic? All right, how much is during the pandemic? I don't know. My brain, my brain and dates. Like there's a, lot, like, of there's it, a right? lot of those during the pandemic. Yeah. <laughs> Question back. Who, who built the the theme itself? The themes themselves. Did Princeton or did Okay. So the question is, who built the themes themselves? So we, uh, so going from Drupal seven to Drupal eight, we had we had determined we were going to have five themes. We built the the first theme, the tiger theme because if you remember back on that slide where I had the red icon, we, we needed a theme to start building Drupal 7 sites on. Um, I'm sorry, Drupal 8 sites. So we built the Tiger theme and then we had FFW build the other four themes. So, and the, and the only reason we allowed, quote unquote allowed for the other themes is because we knew that they were used by families of websites, like multiple websites use them. Otherwise, Tiger is where everybody went um, I think our scholar sites went to a lab theme. Yeah, yes, they most went to a, so our scholar sites went to a lab theme. But so we built Tiger and FFW built the other themes. And these other themes were sub themes of Tiger, right? Yeah, I don't remember. I uh, so the so. question is, were they sub themes of Tiger? I think they might might have been. I'm looking at Link. Yeah, yes, we, they are. We okay. used all the components that you guys have. We didn't we didn't do anything new there. <laughs> 
Yeah. So there was one slide comparing how long it took for the different types of sites, and were the differences in the length of time um, running the migration scripts, or was it all in the QA and the remediation? It was mostly yeah, the, the question. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> uh, was the timing of the sites mostly in the migration scripting piece of it, or in the timing for the QA piece of it? Um, at first, it was mostly the QA piece of it. We did have some in the migration scripting at the beginning too, because we had to optimize so many of them just kind of throughout. Uh, but I would say the manual QA was really where a lot of that kind of came in because we had to make decisions around what things were going to be manual versus what things we were going to build into the automation process. Um, over time, a lot of that got super refined and we were down, I mean, we were doing a hundred sites a week, I think, or every two weeks. Like yeah, it was yeah, like, yeah, 80 to 100 sites, and um, that's when we were able to refine it and get those numbers like way down per site. Uh, but mostly because the QA by that point, we were kind of like, oh, everything looks great. We have this so refined now that we know what to target and we know what to find from that QA. So how many iterations did you run? How many batches? Uh, let's see, so our open scholar bundle had like 700 something sites. Did we get up to 20 badges? Mm -hmm. I think in total, maybe? Definitely for the site builder bundle, the first bundle that had uh, less than 700, we got up to 11 batches, I believe. Yeah. I think, yeah, in total, like all three, I think we had like something like 20, but yeah, the first one I think was 11, I think you're right, yeah. So were you retraining because obviously there's changes in the editing experience were you retraining yeah. all your editors at the same like yeah all these batches were running? It, so training is voluntary people could show up for training or not um byron is our uh oh sorry the question was we'll be training people during this upgrade yes so training is voluntary byron is our trainer our primary trainer so part of our communications were we're upgrading your site around this time period you are welcome to t attend the training before or after. So ahead of the entire start of the project, we had the new training class rolled out. And part of that was also to discourage people and send the message to campus like, Drupal 7's done, we're not even gonna train you on it anymore. Um, come to the new training. How did you handle the feedback from like, your community of set builders for like, the platform? And like, how did you take that feedback like, oh, we should iterate or yeah. not. Yeah, that, yeah, so question is how do we handle feedback about the platform? Um, it's something we still talk about today because we get continual feedback today. So we have a couple channels where people send us feedback. One is through our support tickets. So if we hear of someone who needs something, wants something, and the platform doesn't do it, we log it in our JIRA backlog and we'll tell them, Great, you know, no, not always say not always a great suggestion, but thanks for letting us know about the suggestion. We might either tell them it's already in our backlog, we're not sure when we're gonna get to it, or we'll put it in our backlog. Here's a number, we give them a reference number, it makes them kind of feel good, like, oh, they really heard me, they they, they wrote it down. Um, and I will be transparent with them. I'll say, I'm not sure where we're we're gonna get to this one. If you want the feature, they can pay us to do the feature and bump it up in our backlog. Or I can sometimes say, this is going to be released two months from now or four months from now. And that's always a good feeling. This, so, so the support is one channel, email. I see people in, like walking around in hallways. They tell me about a feature. Um, and we also hold a monthly <coughs> user group where um, we get together and people talk and they give us feedback. So. Thank you. During the process, you had a spreadsheet as well, too, that people had to fill out with like their comments and defects and things like that, right? We we did, yeah. yeah. So what we tried to do is just anecdotally try and like think of, oh wow, five people have asked us for this in our sprint planning meetings for the platform. So we have a monthly sprint planning meeting for the site builder platform, it's continually being enhanced and improved. We would um, have people participate, or our staff, just my staff participates, and they'd advocate for that. Like, I really, you know, or I'm building a site and I'm tired of doing this, can we please fix this? So it's an advocation process. Yeah. Sorry, I just know that we yeah. use that now because we thought it was a great process. Yeah. <laughs> okay. I love your documentation and I love the, uh, that you have like a name for the service, Site Builder. It sounds like you have a bit of a community. Like, does your community have a name? Do they have? Slack channels and oh, we don't have 
a name. They're no. just the just site builder <laughs> users. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. Swag. <laughs> so we are well. Our the, our monthly meeting is Website Wednesday. We meet at one Wednesday. We talk about websites on a Wednesday. So yeah, no, no yeah, swag. Yeah. We have pizza, sometimes <laughs> Hoagie Haven, sometimes street Communication Chipotle. managers. Yeah. And web developers. Yeah. yeah. yeah it's, a, it's an open community to communication managers, to web developers, to someone who wears 10 different hats in their department, and one of them happens to be updating the website. So, wide variety. Well, maybe one more, two more questions, and I think we're at time. Yeah. Did, Go ahead. Did you, did you, how much of, your, of the asset injectors did you roll in? Your flagship, uh, CSS. So the question is, how much of our asset injectors did we? Oh, CSS injector. I don't. I didn't actually run any metrics on that. Um, we tried not to do a lot of it. In the new platform, what we knew prior from the first version of the platform was that people liked to have the ability to customize their sites. So Princeton is described, we, Princeton has the brand, we are black and orange and a tiger. People do not have to use that brand here. So we're not a branded house, we're a house of brands. So for example, the building we're in now is the school, um, SPIA, School of Public and International Affairs. They can look pink if they wanted to. So we knew people liked that. And so what we did was we built in a couple um, uh, accessible color options for them to pick from, lights, darks, backgrounds. And we tried to eliminate the need for people to have to put in CSS, and for my own team to put in CSS. We tried to we tried to reduce it. Didn't get rid of all of it, um, and I'm not sure about how much we got rid of. Yeah, yeah, we did this. Yeah. 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 Okay, for one more. Is it? Yeah, I just question about: Do you have any problem with domain management? Oh. We could talk about that at lunch. <laughs> uh, not so, yeah, so the question is, do we have a problem with domain management? Not so much. So um, I recently pulled together a committee and wrote the pol our first domain name policy. It's published online. And that rolled out in May, I believe, of last year. Um, so we did have a problem, and now we have a policy, and it's less of a problem. So, yeah. Okay. So thank you, everyone. Thank you.